Welcome everyone. Hi, my name is Joe Ferrara. Um, I'm Vice President and Chief of Staff at Georgetown University. And I'm pleased today to welcome all of you to this town hall on uh, student life, residential living, financial aid issues uh, that we will be uh, discussing today for the fall 2020 semester. Uh, I want to thank our Georgetown University Student Association, and I will turn to the president of the Student Association in a moment. But I want to thank GASA for their uh, co-sponsorship of this, of this event today. Uh, over the last several weeks and months, we have been working very closely with a lot of constituents, our students, our faculty, uh, parents, uh, alumni, as we have uh, sought to do to put together a plan for how we can bring back um, our community to campus in a very safe uh, and responsible way. And so today what we wanna do is, is be in a position to um, answer some questions and provide as much information as we possibly can. I'd like to take a minute and just say that our focus through all of this has been the health and safety of our community. We recognize that we are in the midst of a global pandemic, a global health emergency. This is unprecedented. None of us have ever gone through anything like this. And as you all know, uh, in the spring semester, we had to take unprecedented steps to turn our operations into virtual operations, both academically as well as our other campus operations. And in the recent weeks and months, we've turned our attention now to focus on the return to campus in the fall. We have been doing this very uh, close in close contact with, with our faculty and student community. We've also been coordinating with the District of Columbia. Mayor Muriel Bowser of the district has issued a plan for reopening the District of Columbia, and that plan calls for higher education institutions in the district to coordinate very closely with the city. And so we are working very closely with the city and their approval will be required for us to follow through on our plans. That approval from the district and monitoring the ongoing public health uh, conditions, not only in the district area, but nationally are gonna be very important uh, as we prepare to return to campus. Um, we have also been focused, I'll make one other comment and then I'll turn to my colleague, Nico Ferretti. Uh, we've been focused on all members of our community in the past week. We have, we've been focused particularly on international students, uh, given the ruling that came out from Immigration and Customs Enforcement that has now been rescinded. And we're happy to answer questions on that issue as well. Um, so thank you again. We look forward to this opportunity to share information with you and take some questions. Uh, and this will be part of an ongoing process as we prepare for the return to the to campus in the fall. Let me now turn to Nico Ferretti, who is the president of the Georgetown University Student Association, uh, for some opening comments. Nico, I'll turn it to you. Thanks, uh, Vice President Ferrara. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as uh, Vice President Ferrara said, I'm the president of the Georgetown University Student Association, GASA. Uh, the official student, undergraduate student government. GUSA, along with many other student leaders and organizations like Georgetown Disability Alliance and the academic councils, have been meeting and tirelessly working with administrators to represent students and advocate for your needs and concerns this fall. Uh, the culmination of that work came with the announcements, announcement of the fall plans on Monday, July 6th, a uh, week and a half ago, or two weeks ago now. Uh, while it was nice to have clarity on the university's plans, we know that many students felt left out and many concerns are still unmet. Today, we hope to talk through some of those concerns and um, get a little more information out about the fall. Uh, we will be posting a recording of the roundtable on our social media. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Our handle on both platforms is at G-U-S Association, that's at G-U-S Association, all one word. Uh, I recommend that you check one of those platforms somewhat regularly in the coming weeks. Uh, we often collect survey data from students and publish updates on projects that may be relevant to your needs, especially related to the fall. Now I would like to turn over, uh, now I'd like to introduce the Vice Provost of Education, Rohan Williamson. Mm 
on you. Uh, sorry, I wasn't unmuted. So um, it's just a pleasure to get a chance to talk to you guys. Uh, so I want to talk about a few things. I mean, there's been a lot of preparation in place for this past uh, summit preparing for the fall. And as pointed out, no one's gone through this before. So um, keep that in mind. And we, one thing I wanted to ask is just, just be patient because as we go through this, um, we're, 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 we've done a lot to prepare. We try to anticipate all of the questions, all of those concerns that may come up, but some things we may miss out on. And remember, you can go to your advising dean to ask any specific questions, but we've dealt broadly with questions in terms of how we're going to deliver courses. Um, and remember that a virtual environment, a hybrid environment is something new, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily worse than what you had before. Faculty have spent the summer training, preparing as much as possible uh, for this. Do you have an experience that's new, different, but also try, are unique to the course that you're in? So it's not a one size fit all. Uh, and, 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 and so the delivery method, again, could be different, but it may be a lot better. And keep in mind, too, there's a lot of anxiety on all, on all fronts. Uh, fac faculty have been preparing, uh, but they haven't done this. They want to make sure to deliver a good product or a good course to the students, but uh, it's new for them as well. Some may have taught in the spring, some have, uh, have not. Um, we've made adjustments. We're trying to be flexible um, in grading and also flexible with choices that you may make, including these of absences or going to on part-time status. Uh, so all these are in anticipation of, uh, of, of a fall term that will be unique. Uh, but uh, as, as we've been flexible, we ask that from you as well. And we're open to all questions. If, if, if issues arrive, then uh, you, can, you can reach out to us for, for some response. But we have tried to address all those issues within classrooms, within broadly speaking with policies in preparation. Um, but the main thing I wanted to do in closing before I, 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 I end is just to be, be patient because as things don't happen, we have to adjust um, even when the fall comes. So um, uh, at that point, I'll stop there and anticipate your questions. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm next. <laughs> My name is uh, Patricia McWade, and I'm the Dean of Student Financial Services, which is the Financial Aid Office. And our office has long had the policy of meeting full need for our undergraduate students. And this will not change due to the financial difficulties associated with the pandemic. By meeting full need, we mean that we take the full cost of attendance into consideration. And cost of attendance includes not only tuition and fees, but um, dormitory room and meals and travel expenses, personal expenses, books. It's everything associated with the cost of attendance. And so we start with that number and then we subtract what we think the family can afford to pay based on the information that we get from the aid application. And so when you take the cost of attendance minus the expected family contribution, that's the need that we pledge to meet. So students can apply by completing a FAFSA, that's the federal free application for federal student aid and the college scholarship service profile form. Um, they need to submit parents and student tax returns. And all of this is clearly spelled out on our website. So aid applications are reviewed every year and all undergraduate scholarship aid is need-based. We don't offer any so-called merit aid because you're all meritorious. So it's based on financial need. We package aid in the following categories. First, a Pell Grant, if a student qualifies according to the federal government rules, and the maximum Pell Grant is about $6,000. Then we package some student loan, anywhere from 3,500 to 5,500 each year, depending upon the student's year in school. And we package federal work study anywhere from 3,000 to 3,600, again, depending upon the student's year in school. The remainder of the need is met with Georgetown Scholarship, which ranges from as much as $75,000 a year to as little as $1,000, depending upon each individual student's need. So first year and transfer students have received their award notifications already. For continuing students whose aid applications are complete, 
aid notifications will be sent via my access on July 31st before the bills are sent. Many of our notifications have been ready to go, but we needed to wait until we know who is being invited to return to campus and who will study remotely. We will be adjusting the cost of attendance number to reflect any changes in the amounts billed for both those approved to be here and those studying remotely. We recognize some students studying remotely may need funding for housing and meals, and these requests will be approved on a case-by-case -case basis. So once these notifications go out, students can appeal the decision by completing the change in circumstances form, which is also on our website. Appeals are reviewed once or twice a week, depending on the volume, and those studying less than full-time will be eligible for aid as long as they are taking at least six credits. Those enrolled for fewer than six credits are unable to receive federal student aid according to federal regulations. But Georgetown will take a look at those students enrolled for fewer than six credit hours, and if you can't afford to pay for them, you may request Georgetown scholarship aid. And that's clearly an exception to any past year rulings. Student employment opportunities will be available in our app, which is called Hoya Works. Um, both federal work study and non work study jobs will be posted there. Students may work either in person at Georgetown or remotely with the permission of their employer. We anticipate having many employment opportunities available for students who receive federal work study as part of their aid award. Students must actually work and record their hours worked each week on timesheets with their hiring department. And then students will be paid bi weekly at least the, the minimum wage of $15 per hour. So I'm now going to turn it over to Bill Huff, who's the Director of Residential Services. Thanks, Thanks Pat. Um, Bill Huff, he, him, his, the Director of Residential Service, one of the two directors in the Office of Residential Living. Uh, I want to thank you all for your questions or sort of around housing selection and the assignments process and that's what I'm going to talk about first. So first I want to talk to sort of the experience for our incoming first year students. So for our first year students, that's an assignments process. You all should have, for all the students, first year students who were invited to campus should have received an email last week's sort of outlining what the process was. One of the first steps for you to do is to go into our Hoya housing link and click whether you indicate whether you're gonna come back to campus or not and live on campus. We're asking all first year students to commit to that by the, by the end of the day tomorrow, Friday, the 17th of July. Um, one of the questions we've gotten is, if I click that I'm coming back and I change my mind, can I change my mind? And the answer is yes, you can change your mind, but we ask that you let us know as soon as possible and you can go into the Hoya housing and change the link. Same thing if you, indicated you weren't going to return to campus and now you want to come back to campus, um, you would just go into Hoya Housing and indicate that. Eventually we will turn that off, but at least for the next little while we're going to keep that open because we know this is a tough decision for all of you. For our returning students, we tried to sort of mimic as close to a regular housing selection process as possible. So tomorrow on Friday, all the students who've been approved to return to campus will receive an email from Residential Living outlining your process to begin the housing selection process. So as we know, all students will be assigned to one bedroom per living unit on campus, and most of our upper class students will be assigned to on-campus apartments and townhouses. So tomorrow you'll get the email. We're asking those students by Tuesday, the 21st, to go in and indicate whether they're going to accept that offer to live on campus. And again, if you change your mind, you're welcome to change it on Hoya Housing here over the next couple of days as you make those decisions, because we know this is a difficult decision for you and your families. Uh, once you've indicated those students who self-select to go through the housing selection process, we will do a group formation process, which is similar to other years here on campus, which will begin on Friday the 24th. And then that will go through all the way through the July 30th when housing selection will end. Uh, that all is all I have about housing selection and the assignments process. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to the Vice President for Student Affairs, Dr. Todd Olson. All right. Thank you, Bill, very much. And I will take it from here. Good evening, everyone. And um, just getting myself prepared. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very glad you're with us. And I understand this has been a very challenging summer for each of you and for your families. 
There are a couple of issues that I want to talk about that we received a number of questions about. And I'll start with the question that many of you asked about what was the process for determining that first year students would be privileged in their ability to return to campus. And I'll note a couple of things about that process. One, we know this is a very, very difficult choice um, for everyone at the university to make. We would really like to have all of our, uh, our students back with us. And we know that, that this is, is agonizing for many of us. I wanna let you know that the decision to privilege first year students really has to do with the fact that these students have not yet had the chance to join our community. They've not yet had the chance to have any on-campus experience. And we believe as they make this important for the transition to college for the first time, that it was vital to give them a chance to connect, a chance to um, experience the, the campus environment, although it will be a different one this fall than in a normal fall, and a chance to really dive into their academic experience. Um, with that noted, I also received, we received a number of questions about our high need students in a variety of ways of defining need very broadly, who applied to return to campus and to live on campus this fall. And I wanna let you know that a very thoughtful committee of university administrators reviewed those requests. Um, they did so carefully. They looked at criteria such as students experiencing housing or food insecurity, students with safety and security concerns in their current living environment, um, and students with extraordinary living conditions and particular financial need issues and students who for other reasons are just not able to succeed academically in their home environment. And I apologize if you can hear my beagle wheezing behind me. I have an elderly dog um, spending time with me here. Um, we read those applications with great care uh, with an appreciation for the information that students shared with us. We know it's difficult to share such deeply personal information and we recognize that many of our students face significant challenges at home. And at the same time, we need to balance our interest in bringing students back to the hilltop with the knowledge that the public health guidelines we're dealing with limit the number of students that we can bring back safely to our fairly compact campus. Um, we very much hope that the public health situation will change as we go through the semester and will allow us as we go forward to look at bringing additional groups of students back to campus in subsequent stages. Um, but again, that is all dependent on what happens with public health conditions, both nat nationally and here in the DC area. We also received a number of questions about dining on campus. Um, and I wanna note that we will plan to have um, Leo's open, several outlets and sections of Leo's open to provide an array of options and some options open in the Levy Center as well. In answer to questions we heard repeatedly, there, you will not need to just grab your food and go eat it by yourself in your room. There is um, really an opportunity. There'll be some indoor seating in Leo's. We know it will be less than in a normal semester. Um, we'll also look at other areas where students can safely gather at a social distance, spend time together as they dine. So please know that we're thinking about that. And please know that we'll have a broad array of options. And while all the food you get will need to be packaged, there won't be an opportunity to, to sort of get your own food. Um, we will have a wide array of options there, including some ability to pre-order from your mobile device and, um, and have that food um, you know, ready for you when you arrive. I think the last thing that I wanna say is that we're, we received a number of questions about mental health needs uh, for all our students, for some of our underrepresented students and students in vulnerable categories. Um, please know that the staff in our counseling center, our student health center and health education services have been working hard to meet student needs throughout this time. They've done remarkable work with students, connecting with them virtually. And much of that work will continue virtually in the fall semester. Um, but please know we are thinking about not only the individual support and therapy needs for our students, but also group experiences and learning experiences to support our students with those situations. So with that, I will now turn uh, the microphone over to Bryce Badger, who's Vice President of the Georgetown University Student Association, and Bryce will lead off our questioning. So thank you, Bryce. Thank you, Dr. Olson. So like Dr. Olson said, right now we're gonna kick off the question aspect of this town hall. Um, for the last couple of three days, we've been collecting questions, suggestions from the student body. And so our first one will be going to Vice Provost Williamson. 
It's related to academic affairs. And the first question is, how are administrators and professors preparing to offer virtual classes that are at the same level of education as they were in prior semesters? Okay, thank you, Bryce. Uh, that's a great question. And uh, just to maybe start historically here. So as a university, we've been investing in technology for close to 20 years now and sort of thinking about uh, short term disruptions, you know, if there's snow days and things like that. So uh, technologically, we have uh, a lot of things in place. Uh, so after the spring, as some of you well know, uh, we had questionnaires go out. Um, okay, how did how, how was your experience? The same, the similar went to faculty. Then from that point, we started to make adjustments uh, in terms of what didn't go well, what went well, and what did we do more or less of. And so over the summer, the faculty, uh, have, they, they've gone to a lot of training. And the training is specific to the course and the school. Uh, so we know that there are different learning methodologies from whether you're learning, say, calculus or philosophy is a little bit different. So the experience was adjusted for the type of class. Um, and so, and, 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 in, and in doing these adjustments, we, we, in the classrooms or the teaching environments, even at home, we invested in technology to make sure that the experience coming from the faculty member is at a good technological level for the students. And that's, you're going to notice the in-class experience from a technology standpoint is going to be very different. There's been uh, there's a, a lot of investment in that, and some classes are going to be more hybrid than others, depending on who's in the classroom. And I talked a bit about the training, the training that was done through our candles uh, of faculty to prepare them in a unique way for their classes. And that includes the pedagogy. So things that the way you've learned before is going to be a little bit different. I mean, we know that you know, typically a fact that someone stands in front of a class and delivers a, a lecture, it's going to be a little bit different in that you may, you, you're going to be asked to participate more and we're going to make use of the technology uh, like breakout rooms and things like that. Um, and, and, and so whether the class is hybrid, meaning just both going on, or just virtual, meaning it's all online, there's going to be an adjustment in the pedagogy to deal with the environment under which you are. From an administrative standpoint, there is a lot going on in the background. So those who are on campus, there will be cleaning up the classrooms between, between sections. Administratively, for your experience, uh, we're going to be, there's a lot of investment to those that are delivering in that we may need to make adjustments very quickly. So there's a background at work here, and even in the classroom, there's gonna be teacher's aides within the classroom, if you wanna call it that technology assistant within the class, because as I said, uh, be flexible, because believe me, faculty have a lot of anxiety. Some faculty have been teaching this way for 35, 40 years, and keep in mind some of you that whose parents are Georgetown alums probably have some of the same faculty members, and, and so, they, they have, they're making a tremendous adjustment for this and we're gonna provide them with all the assistance a, a, as possible. Um, and so, but for those that are on uh, different time zones and that we know that there's variability in your network connection, the speed and your home environment. So faculty, they've been asked to make more notes available. A lot of your courses, the synchronous stuff will be recorded. So if you can't watch it at the time where you're in a different time zone, you may be able to look at it later that evening or some other time because it will be recorded. Faculty are gonna be more liberal in, in making their notes available and extra notes and different types of material to make sure that because you can't be synchronous with the, literate, with the lecture, you're gonna have an opportunity to see it later. Also, some courses are gonna have more asynchronous uh, material. That means things that are pre-recorded and you could watch it when you want, and and also office hours are going to be obviously through Zoom. Faculty have been asked to maybe have more office hours, and may, and that will allow smaller groups uh, to have discussions during office hours. Some of you that may have a teacher assistant, then you're going to have office hours with them as well. So, and these are going to be unique to the type of course and the type of pedagogy that's unique to that class. So, there's been over the pa over the summer, a lot of work has been done. 1,750 of the faculty um, from um, full-time, part-time, non-tenure line, line and adjunct have gone through this process of learning. So we've spent a lot of time over the summer preparing for this, uh, but uh, this has never been done before at this level and this extent, and we're uh, well prepared to make adjustments along the way. So uh, if things aren't going well, then we're gonna adjust to make them better because we've been practicing but you know we you don't know how things will go to the actual game start so we're really we're really looking forward to this 
we're all uh, a bit nervous. There's a lot of anxiety. We think we've practiced well. We've prepared. We've made the investment. And so I think the fact we're prepared to go. So um, I, 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 I hope that provided you with some insights. And, and, and I want to make another point that sometimes the way we're used to seeing a class be prepared for the difference. And it doesn't mean it's good. And I think the assumption is it's going to be worse. Some courses are actually better done this way. And you may learn better because you're going to be able to schedule things sort of uniquely to you. And some courses may be uh, much more effective in a virtual environment than otherwise. So this is going to be a learning process for all of us. And um, I, I'm, I'm really excited and, and confident and, and um, very optimistic that things are going to go well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Provost Williamson. So our second question is for Dean McWade. Uh, and it has to do with financial aid decisions and uh, when they will be sent and uh, just uh, expanding on, you know, what you've talked about already and the details of the process this year. Sure. So as I mentioned in the introduction, we have sent the award notifications already to the newly admitted students, both the first year and transfer students. So they, they have their, their notices. The continuing aid decisions were held until we knew and we know who's going to be in residence on campus um, or not learning remotely, let me put it that way. And those decisions will be sent out um, by July 31st via the My Access site. And students have to go into My Access to view the award. And while you're there, please accept or reject what we've offered you. I mean, sometimes students don't want to take the loan or they don't want to take the work. I don't know of anyone who doesn't want to take the scholarship, but you know, I could be surprised. So please um, indicate whether you accept the award or decline it. And then what we'll do is put those credits onto the student billing statement in time so that um, before the billing statement goes out on August 4th, the credits will appear. Now that's only for those whose aid applications are complete. And I must say we have a lot of students whose aid applications are not complete yet. And we've been sending emails consistently um, th since March to say, you're missing this, that, or the other. And until we get what we need, then we won't be able to send you the award. So pay attention to those missing information emails that, that we send and get, get us what we need. And if you can't get us what we need, then be in touch with your financial aid counselor and let us know why, so that we can um, come to some understanding about what, what, what's going on in the family situation. So our um, website is finaid.georgetown edu and when you go to that site you'll see the names of the counselor and associate director teams that we have and it's it's divided alphabetically um, there are four or five different groups so you'll see for example that students whose last name begins with a through d um, see a certain counselor and then the associate director so uh, please be in touch with that person if you have problems getting your application complete. That's, that's really important because we want to get everybody's award notification out as soon as we can. And I know you've been waiting patiently for them. And um, it's certainly understandable that you've run out of patience at this point. <laughs> but we really do need to know who's going to be in residence and who isn't because that affects the cost of attendance budget, which as I mentioned earlier, is the first component of the need calculation. We have to see how much it's, it's going to cost you. And then we subtract what we think you and your family can pay. And then that's the need that we meet 100% of. Okay. Thank you, Dean, Dean McWade. Um, our next question relates to residential living. It's for you, Mr. Huff. So could you tell me a little bit about the process for housing selections and assignments for incoming first years and for upperclassmen? will be returning to campus for the fall semester? Sure, so I, I gave you sort of the quick brief overview sort of of how those two process work, but I think there's a little bit more nuance that we've seen in some of your questions that have come in. So um, 
one of the things for first years is a lot of first years, even though you're going to, most first years will be living in on-campus residence halls. Um, we pretty much plan that most of our residence halls will utilize by the first year student population. So that means that you'll probably be alone in a room utilizing the shared or suite style bathrooms on the floor. But some students have asked, can I request to have someone live next to me? And, and just due to the timing of where we are, with being so close to the start of the academic year and that normally this process starts much earlier. Unfortunately, we can't accommodate those requests currently. However, um, we hope to find a process that maybe after we start the school year and if there is a way that we can do some room switches to accommodate people's needs better, we'll, we'll work with you and you'll work with your community director who is the full-time live-in master's level um, professional who sort of runs each residential building at Georgetown. So for first years, unfortunately, we can't sort of do groupings or pairings of folks within sort of residential buildings. Um, the another cool thing that we have for upper class students is some students have said, how do I know what students have been approved to live on campus for the fall? So we have a system within the Hoya housing system that all students who are upper class students who are going through the housing selection process starting next week will be able to communicate with other students who've been approved. So that way you can sort of build networks and identify people that you wanna live with in on-campus apartments and townhouses. And again, um, you'll each have your own bedroom, but there will be some shared living space in our kitchens and uh, like living room areas in those apartments. Because as we know, uh, most of our apartments and townhouses on campus have multiple bedroom units. And so there will take some sort of connection for students to build some sense of community and trust with each other. And then we know there's some anxiety and nervousness about shared living space with other people. So we're hoping this communication tool that's built into the housing selection process will be one great tool for students to sort of um, be able to navigate the process better. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Um, so the next question we have uh, relates to public health concerns, and I think Dr. Olson, you would probably best be able to address this. Uh, what is the testing plan for students returning to campus? So, thank you very much, Nico. And I will note a few things about that plan. First of all, we are taking seriously the need for testing all the members of our community who will be coming back to campus or even the area around campus. Um, and that starts with sending a, a test, an at-home test out to students probably the last 10 days of July or the first couple days of August that you should receive that at home that we ask you to do. It's a very simple saliva test you can do at home so that we have a sense of, of who tests negative in advance of arrival. When students arrive on campus, those who are living on campus will be asked to take a test right away and we are still working through details but are likely to be asked to quarantine briefly while we're awaiting those test results in their residence hall room or on their floor. And then they'll, they'll also be test, you'll also be tested if you're coming into camp about a week to 10 days after that, just so that we have the best data we can so we can identify early on those students who may test positive. And we're doing the same thing with our faculty and staff. And we really, we know this is a somewhat intrusive process, but we also believe, and the public health experts have told us, this is the best way to assure that when we have positive cases, we can catch them and support those folks, get them into an isolation setting um, where they can be cared for and can be distant from others. So we're really working hard on that. We'll also ask everyone who's on campus, students, faculty, and staff, to download and use an app that is from this company, One Medical, that we're working with. And we'll ask everyone on, on campus each morning to report their temperature and to do a symptom report and then to attest that they are in good health. And that's a step that'll be necessary for folks to come on to, into campus buildings each day. And I want to note with this that our, our Student Health Center and the colleagues at One Medical are standing by to help and to answer questions and to provide support. Um, so we'll do the very best we can to make this a sort of a comprehensive process, but also a supportive process for folks as we deal with these very unusual circumstances. So thank you, Nico. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Our next question relates to the life on campus and life off campus. It's for you, Vice President Ferrara. Could you tell me a little bit about what the campus compact is that students will be asked to sign? Thank you, Bryce. I'm happy to do that. And I'm going to answer that question and I'd like to take one additional minute and just uh, elaborate on my comments in the opening on international students. But, but let me start with the campus compact. As you just heard from my colleague Todd Olson, 
Uh, we are taking public health very, very seriously. Part of that pro approach is going to be requiring every member of our community who's returning to any Georgetown campus uh, and every student who's going to be returning and living in neighborhoods adjacent to our main campus in Washington, D.C., to sign what we're calling a Georgetown University Compact. And what this compact is going to do is it's basically each of us pledging to abide by health and safety measures so that we can make sure that our community is safe. Uh, one, of the, one of the phrases that has started to pick up as we have these meetings and talk about this is, it will take each of us to protect all of us. We all have to participate in this public health framework to ensure that we can keep our community safe. The compact is a way of formalizing that, and it's also a way of sending a message that we're really serious about this. When you ask someone to sign a document, you're asking them to pledge um, and, and commit, each of us to protect all of us. So that's what the campus compact is. And Bryce, real quick, on the international students, I mentioned this at the beginning, International students have always been a very, very important part of the Georgetown community. I'm really sorry about the ups and downs that international students have faced, particularly in the last 10 days. We had Immigration and Customs Enforcement issue a reckless ruling uh, that overturned guidance that had previously been put in place last spring when we had to go to virtual. That caused a tremendous amount of anxiety and stress. Georgetown and many other higher ed institutions jumped into action and filed lawsuits. We joined several of those lawsuits. The pressure worked and the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency this week rescinded that reckless order. That is very, very good news. It takes us back to the process uh, for international students to allowing them to participate in classes virtually, whether they're inside or outside the US without losing their visa status or impacting their progress toward work authorization. One, there's one piece of information we're still working that's not clear, and we're following up with the Department of Homeland Security to get clarity. And that has to, that, that is how this new ruling relates to our new students. So they've taken us back to the place we were before in terms of our current students. We are working to get clarity now in terms of how this applies to new students. Uh, all I ask is that you watch for communications from our Office of Global Services, as well as communications from your own deans uh, in terms of the school that you're coming into. But we're monitoring this very closely. Bryce, thanks a lot. Thanks, Vice President Ferrara. Um, so our next question has to do with academic policies uh, and can be answered best by uh, Vice Provost Williamson. So the question is, uh, can you provide information on what academic and grading policies will be uh, for the fall 2020 semester? Um, and what will attendance requirements, continuation of pass-fail option, and uh, the standardization of academic policies uh, regarding exams look like? Thank you, Nico. Uh, Matt, again, I know that's a question that's at top of mind for many of you and so um, in fact that was a lot of decisions were uh, made actually earlier today and so the process for grading which i know is, is the hot topic will be pretty much what was done in the spring so if you're not aware of that in the spring what uh what we're going to do is you're going to make a determination of uh, of your choice right now the date is is two is the end of the study period which is december the 10th you decide uh, whether you would like a letter grade or use what we call SCRNC. So on, on the 10th, you make a grade determination, say what I want is a letter grade. So you, how have you been doing? You've studied and then you say, okay, I want it to be, uh, I, I'll take the, the letter grade option. If you don't say anything, the default is a letter grade. Let's be clear, let me repeat that. If you don't do anything, then the default will be a letter grade. The system automatically goes to a letter grade. At that time, you can, you can decide whatever you, if you have whatever grade you think you have, you can say, I'll take the uh, SCRNC, which is, um, you may call it pass fail, but it's not really the same as the pass fail. There's sort of three levels here. So you will have that choice. And the date, let me repeat it again, is December the 10th. 
which is the, the end of the study period. Now, the process that we went through for other, um, the questions about attendance um, and, and the standardization of academic, uh, academic policies. So broad academic policies um, it, it, in general stay the same now, but I know that what you're describing is your in-class experience. What, we, what faculty have done this summer, uh, directive was uh, we'll take a course, go to the department or the group or the discipline level, and the first determination in that, in that course is what's the best delivery method and how do we need to take the, change the pedagogy for virtual or hybrid? What's the best way of teaching the class? That determination was made. Then there was a standard date, standardization across that, that area, department, discipline level and say this is where. And, and so there's a choice, whether again, whether in the college at SFS, of what unit of measurement they use. So, if you're in the business school, it'll be what we call areas, but it may be department somewhere else. So at that level, that's where the standardization will come in. That's where the, the discussion was. So it may be different when you go from, say, one sort of school to another in course or from one discipline, even say you're in the college, it may be slightly different. But within one, it will be, it should be very standardized. So the standardization question is going to be at that level, because remember earlier I mentioned it. Courses are very different. I mean, and you know that some courses you may, I mean, it, it, you, you, you write uh, papers and some you don't and some the lecturing is different. So we, uh, we would like to see differences as normal of standardization of the policies at that level, but within the broader university policy. So you may see some differences, but within the discipline, it should be, it should be standard. And if there's an issue, again, you start with your advising dean. Uh, to deal with that. So that's, that's the, uh, uh, again, I know it's a, a question. I wanted to go back and say, you're going to have the decision this end of the study days, December the 10th. If you do nothing, you get a letter grade. So don't forget to respond. And then faculty have been told to remind you guys of that. Um, and then you, you, make, you make the decision then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Provost Williamson. Um, our next question relates to financial services is for you, Dean McWade. So if a student feels that they're, they'd like to appeal their financial aid decision, exactly what is the process for that and when will those appeals be heard? Sure, thank you. Well, we actually um, have an appeals committee in financial aid that operates all year round. And so we have been hearing quite a few appeals um, from the newly admitted students and from the transfer students. And we've even gotten appeals from continuing students before they knew what their award was <laughs> because they're so concerned about the situation. So we are responding to appeals. Uh, we meet at once or twice a week, depending upon the need, if we need to meet more than that to get the responses to the appeals that I'm sure we'll get right after the bills go out, then we're prepared to do that. But before we do, you need to go onto our website and complete the change in circumstances form that's located on our website. And it asks for a lot of information, specific information about what changed in the family financial situation. So it often will require both the student and parent or parents to um, complete the form together to get the numbers that we're, we're looking for. But the appeal process is, is quick. And you'll, you'll hear within um, a week, maybe sometimes less than a week. And um, if you don't, then be sure to contact your financial aid counselor to, to make sure that the form was received and that we indeed got to review it. Thank you, Dean McWade. Uh, Mr. Hoff, this next question is for you. And it is, what will move-in look like for all students and why is it structured differently this year? Thanks so much, Nico. Um, so we just wanna acknowledge that we wanna make your transition back for those who are approved to come back to campus as smooth as possible. So um, one thing we have to take into consideration is with COVID-19 that we need to adhere to social distancing and making sure that we're keeping campus as de-densified as possible and acknowledging that students also need some support as they come back. So the first year is when you received your, your emails last week, you noted that we are limiting the number of people who can come and assist you move in to one to two people. We know that's a, that's a hard decision for our families and our students. 
but we really have to take into consideration the fact that if we allow too many people to come back to campus, um, it just increases the chances for us to not be able to contain and, and you know, watch the health of our students and the rest of the folks who work on campus. So that's been really purposeful. One thing you'll also notice that's a little different this year is that we've assigned everyone a specific move-in time and date. So for first years, that's gonna be a five-day process from Monday the 17th of August through Friday the 21st of August. You'll be assigned, you were assigned a specific date and a specific time. Now we know for students traveling from far distances, especially our international students, that may not align given that you know flights are very limited in some places. If you have an issue with your day and time, you can go ahead and just email residential living at georgetown.edu. Know that you'll get an automatic response and then within three business days, we'll work to try to reassign your time if we can. And again, uh, we'll do our best to sort of be as flexible. For upper class students, that's gonna be a three day process. So that's gonna be from Saturday, August 22nd through uh, Monday, the 24th of August. Again, you'll be assigned a day and a time. Same thing goes for upper class students. Um, if that day and time doesn't work for you, you're welcome to email residential living and that that day and time will be sent in the email that will go out tomorrow afternoon. Um, and so again, we're doing our best to try to make sure that students can feel supported. Um, and at the same time, also taking into consideration that these are different times with COVID and we want to make sure that we maintain the health of all the people who work on campus and the students who are returning back to make campus their home for the fall semester. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mr. Huff. Um, our next question relates to the Campus Compact is for you, Dr. Olson. So why are off students, off campus students required to join the testing process and sign the Community Compact when they're not allowed to make full use of campus or attend classes in person? So thank you, Bryce. And I know this, is, this has been a very common question. And a, lot, a lot of people have strong views on this, and I understand that. Really, it is about the fact that we know that the students who are living in the neighborhoods immediately off campus will be interacting with and in the same spaces with the students who are on campus and we just know that is a that is a fact and we need to protect the entire community that is going to be together in and right around the hilltop so that is the that sort of the essential fact there bryce and i will also note we know that for many students who are not permitted to live on campus or take classes on campus this is a very tough um, bit of news to to deal with we have tried to make some accommodations and those students who live off campus will be allowed in outdoor spaces on campus and in the tents that we set up that are sort of some outdoor ventilator, you know, so openly ventilated gathering spaces. Um, so while they can't come into buildings, we hope that they can do some interaction again in socially distant and safe ways with their masks on um, in those spaces. So even that opportunity to be walking around the campus um, from our view made it really important that those students be tested and be part of the, the system. So we know this is, again, we know it's very difficult for those folks who are off campus. Please know that we'll continue to assess the public health situation. And if conditions change in a way that allows us to sort of open up the campus a bit more, we'll certainly be attentive to that as we go forward. Um, but we really appreciate students' patience and understanding, and those are the reasons for that, for that approach. So thank you, Bryce. Thanks, Dr. Olson. Um, our next question is, what can you tell us about access to campus buildings for students who are living on campus, uh, places like Yates Fieldhouse and Laringer Library? Uh, Vice President Farrar, do you want to speak to this? Thank you, Nico. Um, we are working through this issue right now. Uh, we have a group of colleagues uh, who is looking at um, all of the buildings on campus. We're focusing initially on our residential undergraduate students who will be on campus. We know we, we're, we're going to have other students, for example, graduate students. We need to think about their access to buildings. But the real focus right now is on our residential undergraduate community. And this is a comprehensive look at dining facilities, um, student centers, places like the Levy Center, Lowinger Library that Nico just mentioned, Yates, um, and, and other places on campus. What we're trying to do is find a way that we can provide reasonable access, but also balance that with uh, our public health framework. Uh, and as you all know, 
from, from your own lives. Right now, part of that public health framework is wearing masks. Part of that public health framework is physical distancing. And we need to be mindful of that with access to buildings. We're gonna have to manage that uh, when we think about people coming into buildings and how many people are in buildings and do we have schedules or reservation systems for certain buildings depending on the use of the building to ensure that we can maintain safe physical distancing uh, at, at, at all times. Um, so that's, a, that's the short answer on that, but we are looking at this right now. And what we wanna do is as we complete this review, we'll be following up with returning students so that you have very clear guidelines as you're, as you're coming back to campus and understand uh, exactly what the building use framework will be. But we are working very hard on this right now and I think we wanna be, we, we wanna get this out very quickly and, and complete this framework uh, as soon as possible. Thank you, Nico. Thanks, Vice President Ferrara. Um, our next question is for Vice Provost Williamson. Could you please elaborate on whether asynchronous learning will be possible for students in different time zones and how is this going to work? Okay, Bryce. Uh, that's, I know that's another question that's at top of mind. And um, so if you think about the time zone issue, and it's, it's very, very difficult because as we start, you know, everyone, uh, Georgetown, had, we get students from all over the world. So you move across, be there in different time zones. So a part of what we've done, and we talked, alluded to that earlier, the asynchronous uh, where if it can be done in any class, we ask faculty to do that. Okay, say so get something asynchronous. Uh, and then also we mentioned taping your, 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 your lecture, all right? So that'll be recorded and students could look at it at their respective times. Adjusting times is very difficult because now you start adjusting times and matching schedules then that was that we thought about that, but that was uh, basically impossible. Um, so it will mean um, that you may have to take a class at a time that in your local time zone that may be uh, somewhat difficult um, uh, or challenging. If you're three hours behind this in your class, you schedule for class at 9 a.m., then it's going to be 6 a.m. where you are. And so there will be some of that. Uh, and if you, and, but we uh, partic pay particular attention in how many students in what class. And it, the, the metric we used was five plus hours away or, or, or exact, and try to adjust as much as possible to meet that particular need. But the, the, to address it more directly is if eight try to record lectures, that's the first one, and uh, make it asynchronous as much as possible. And the difference between the two you may, you may think it's the same, but the asynchronous is when the, the, the lecture or parts of it are recorded in advance and student can watch it before or after whenever they want, a specific meeting. And then the lecture that's live with questions and everything else as if it was a class. That's what I mean by a recorded lecture. Um, so both will be going on for students. So if you're in a different time zone, perhaps you can watch the asynchronous material and then you see how the class went uh, the prior day that you missed. So those that are, I know some of these terms, make sure we're, we're talking about the same thing here. So whatever course it makes sense, we know that courses like uh, statistics and you know, I'm in the business school, wasn't a business school like accounting, those will probably have a, a big asynchronous component. But the case discussion, for instance, will be something that's also recorded or notes made available or different processes taken. So students that are in different time zones can get the effect if they can't uh, attend the class directly, they can at least get a recording, a recording of the class. So that's how we, we, we've thought about it. And also when I'm going to add something here, knowing that some students may make decide, okay, it's better for me to be part-time at this point. Um, the process is just a, a your normal process. And then we'll try to make adjustments as possible. And keep in mind though, that it affects um, as, um, discussed earlier with financial aid, it impacts your financial aid because uh, uh, of the amount, your, your, um, the cost of education. But that's an option. But the direct question, we've, we've done as much as possible to prepare for that, knowing that some students are pretty far away in terms of time. All right, thank you. Thank you, Vice Provost Williamson. Our next question has to do with federal work study, um, and it was just, will federal work study be awarded this year? Uh, Dean McQuaid, could you talk to this? Sure. 
Yes, we're going to offer federal work study um, and we have offered it to the first year students and the transfer students. And federal work study is money that Georgetown receives from the federal government. It's considered part of financial aid. Um, some don't think of it that way because you have to work to get the money, but it is money that comes from the federal government and we put it into financial aid awards for the needy students. And so anyone who has federal work study can get a job on campus and it can be in person or remote. And the minimum wage is $15 an hour. And you can get, um, you get paid every two weeks. And if you don't have federal work study, there are still jobs at the campus and off the campus that are non-work study jobs where the employer pays 100% of the wages. So either way, you should be able to find employment um, by going on to the, the um, app called Hoya Works, and you use your student ID and your PIN number to access that. And then you just um, contact the hiring department. And I'd recommend contacting several. Don't just put all your eggs in one basket and assume that you apply for one job. And if you don't hear, then, you know, if you wait two weeks, then all the other jobs have been taken. So be smart about it, you know, put in five or six applications, see who you hear back from. The other thing you can do is market yourself too, if you have federal work study, because this year, um, just for this year, 100% of your hourly wage can be paid from the federal work study grant. So your hiring employer doesn't have to pay anything out of their operating budget to have you work for them. But the operative word here is work. You have to work. It's an hour's pay for an hour's work. So that the hiring department needs to have work that they can give you to do, either in person or remotely. And we've been real creative with hiring departments um, this summer so far, creating um, federal work study jobs so that all students who have work study as part of their aid package will be able to get a job. Thank you, Dean McWade. Um, my next question is for you, Mr. Huff, this relates to residential living. What will on-campus living look like in the residential building, specifically when it comes to like common rooms and lodger rooms and lobby areas? Like, how's that gonna work? Sure, yeah. Um, so we are committed to trying our best within the current circumstances to make on-campus life be as vibrant and I guess normal as possible. So, you know, as of today, we are not intending on closing down common rooms and kitchens, you know, one highlight of this summer has been we've been able to do some much needed renovations in a lot of our residential buildings. Um, and one of those spaces we put some really big energy into is, is revamping a lot of the kitchens and common areas and replacing the furniture in those spaces so that when students return, the spaces are in the best shape possible. Now you will in those spaces find signage and spaces where if you've been in any, a lot of public spaces where certain elements of furniture will be sort of off. So you can be like, don't sit here, you can sit here. And that's just to make sure that people are social distancing. We'll have policies about how many people can be in common spaces, how many people can be in laundry rooms, how many people can be in the lobbies. Um, but again, you know, we want people to return to campus, those who are approved to have the most vibrant um, and engaging campus community we can, still holding that we're in a time of COVID. So, um, we're really excited for folks to return and you know we also have a group of RAs set to return to campus to support the same sort of community building and support that we've had in previous years and are really appreciative of those students leaders coming back to help us create the campus community that we know you all want. Thank you Mr. Huff. Uh, so we're right at seven which is near our time so I'll ask uh, one more question and let Dr. Olson close us off. Uh, our last question for tonight is why are students social gatherings limited to just 10 people both on campus and off campus so thank you thank you nico and i know this is an area of real concern for many of our students i want to note it really is about safety and health uh, many of you may have seen the stories out of places like the university of washington university of california other places where large parties result in major spreading of COVID 19. And so we are focused on and we understand our limits are more restrictive than the current context in the District of Columbia. And we acknowledge that, but we really believe that any larger gatherings, um, social gatherings, especially in student living spaces, 
present very real health risks. And so we will ask all our students, both on campus and off campus in the local neighborhood, to contain the size of those gatherings to 10 people. And we know that is a challenge. We know it's different from the normal Georgetown social life, but it is one of the steps we can take that we really believe reduces the risk that we'll see spread of the virus in our student population and frankly in others that they might interact with. So it's, it's about health and safety and we appreciate everyone's patience with that. And with that, I just want to thank all of you for tuning in and I hope we got to, we tried to get to some of your major questions. We know there may be more. Um, and, and as you've already heard, there are folks here who are happy to hear from you about a variety of issues. I wanna thank um, both Nico and Bryce, our GUSA leaders, who've done a very thoughtful job of, of helping to convene and lead this conversation. I wanna thank all my colleagues from the administration. Um, so we look forward to this sort of uncharted territory adventure that we'll all be having together uh, at Georgetown this year. So thank you everyone for joining us and, uh, and take good care everyone. We'll talk with you soon. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye everyone. Bye. Good night.